Ever hear the nighttime creaking of a door? These are some truly unsettling locations, whether or not you believe in the paranormal. The haunting at Willow's Weep House. An unremarkable residence on a quiet street in Cayuga, which is a little town in Indiana. The wonderful house looks perfectly normal, even welcoming, called after the huge willow tree in the front garden. However, a closer look uncovers some troubling information. Near a river, the home is situated in the middle of a crossroads. Crossroads and rivers are seen as spiritual gathering areas, frequently for demons and other evil spirits, in both folklore and occult societies. And the property has other strange characteristics as well. The charming clabbered structure looks like a terrific location to live from the front. However, it is clear from above that Willow's Weep has a cross form and faces east. If it wasn't obvious from that alone, the entrance is at the bottom of the home, turning it into an inverted cross. The house's geometry is even more diabolical on the inside, although it may not be obvious at first, the main living area's connecting room's corners come together to form a pentagram. Historians and paranormal researchers have gathered a wealth of data regarding the history of the house, including every suspicious death and documented haunting that has happened in and around it. The house was built in the 1890s. Throughout the property's history, deaths that defy conventional explanations have been documented, including suicides, hangings, and poisonings. The man who built the house was really the first person to pass away, and he was discovered in his bathtub. It was impossible to identify a cause of death. However, death was only the start. Former inhabitants have described seeing shadow figures, hearing voices that weren't theirs, and experiencing poltergeist activity. Residents discovered a deteriorating book in the area between the floor and the packed earth under the house in the middle of the 1950s when replacing a floorboard. When they looked closer, they discovered the weird book was a grimoire, with horrifying depictions of savagery and sinister incantations, this wasn't your typical Wicca book, and it undoubtedly held the owner's most intimate secrets. Even worse, it belonged to a former resident, according to the plaque. The inhabitants fled after burning the book, terrified of the witch's potential reappearance. The account was passed down through the family for many generations until being related to David Spinks by the granddaughter of the finder. Paranormal Investigation at Willow's Weep The property is currently owned by paranormal investigator David Spinks, who has personally performed many of the investigations. He has suggested that this mansion may not only contain darkness but also be the most evil structure ever created. He is not unfamiliar with an evil house. Spark speculates that this is why it might have been designed to hold evil and that the horrifying deaths indicate a sinister presence. Brenda Johnson owned the home before it was purchased by Sphinx, and she intended to renovate and resell it. It wasn't a huge problem for her to purchase a haunted house because she didn't believe in the paranormal. She claims there were no problems at first. Strange things began to happen over time. Johnson initially believed it to be old house knickknacks typical of any old home. She heard periodic hammering from under the floor, which she attributed to rotten pipes, as well as doors swinging or slamming on their hinges. But soon banging could be heard everywhere, from the ceilings and walls. And at that point, injuries to people began to occur. While working on the ceiling, Johnson's kid was struck and hurt by tightly fastened boards that had come loose. Brenda soon discovered six claw marks on her back, as though someone with an additional finger had raked their claws over her, and claimed to have been scratched by an unknown entity. Johnson employed a maintenance worker about the same time as she had purchased the home. He had been cutting the lawn when Deborah heard a cry from the outside. When she hurried outside to see, she discovered the men slumped against the house's wall and unconscious. His spine had been virtually shattered in many places, it was discovered when he was brought to the emergency department. He was unable to recall what happened, but Deborah believes it was because he disregarded her advice and approached the willow tree too closely. After her son's accident and her own attack, she started to pay heed to the legends she had previously disregarded, which claimed that the tree is home to the ghosts of the vengeful dead or demons. The handyman claimed he was healthy enough to do the work he was hired to do after being released from the hospital and having some time to recover, including looking beneath the home to see whether any of the weird pounding was truly coming from the pipes. He had to enter the outer access hatch, crawl on his belly, and then reach the plumbing. But once he was down there, 
he realized it was easier said than done. There were mounds of varied sizes where there ought to have been packed dirt. He started to push them aside to make room for traffic after assuming that groundhogs or rodents were responsible. He discovered the bone while clearing this passage. He wanted to suppose that it came from an old pet that had been buried, or even some dead cattle that had slipped beneath the house. His conviction was short-lived, however, as hands that he couldn't see or feel pulled at him and attempted to bring him to the ground from the shadows. He fought for what seemed an age until he was able to release himself. Johnson, who was working above and heard the ruckus, hurried outside just in time to see the handyman scrambling from the hatch while panting and terrified. He threw the bone at her and said she could find another contractor if she had any issues with his going under the home again. Deborah took the bone to a nearby doctor after suspecting it might be connected to the accidents. The undamaged humerus of an older child who had long since died was immediately recognized by the doctor. When law enforcement was called, they decided not to look into the bone because it was older than 50 years. Johnson did some research and called David Spinks because he was dissatisfied with just ignoring the house's darkest secrets. Spinks' employment as a paranormal investigator was how he first learned about Willow's Weep. She sold the house to Spinks and never looked back after realizing there was nothing she could do to change the situation and that she didn't want her or her family to be associated with the mystery surrounding Willow Weep's death. A lot of ideas have been devised to explain how this unique house, with its strange design, came to be, after compiling accounts and granting access to several paranormal investigators to examine and watch. The most likely explanation for the peculiar shape, the hauntings, and the attacks is that the house was built to contain ghosts and demons rather than to draw them out. But we may never know if this was a charitable deed or the brainchild of a villain with a terrible agenda. The most haunted house in Kansas will give you the shivers. The Sally House has been dubbed the most haunted house not just in Kansas, but also in the entire country. Why, you inquire? Well, it might have something to do with the rumors that surround Sally, a young girl who tragically died after a surgeon performed a botched surgery within the house. The house, which is at 508 2nd Street and was constructed in Atchison, Kansas, in the middle of the 19th century, has seen its share of history throughout the years. The house has changed hands several times and is said to have once been occupied by a young child named Sally, who tragically passed away there while undergoing a disastrous homemade appendicitis surgery. But Sally's tragic tale did not come to the notice of the local and national media until the middle of the 1990s. Deborah and Tony Pickman, the property's previous owners, started to experience weird happenings in the house, including Tony being attacked, hearing strange voices, and even noticing fingerprints on candles that lit themselves. Who then resides at the Sally house? Could it perhaps just be Sally's ghost? Some suspect there may be more to the story, including rumors that a middle-aged woman is responsible for the terrifying attacks. The small property, which was built in the 1800s and contains three bedrooms and two bathrooms, is haunted by ghosts. It was constructed for Michael Finney and his family, who resided there from its construction until 1947. The house hosted several families throughout the years, and four members of the Finney family passed away there from natural causes. However, none would be as enduring as the Pickmans. In the 1990s, this young couple, bushy-tailed and bright-eyed, purchased the house. They quickly began to encounter weird, occasionally violent, happenings at home. Today, the house serves as a spectacle, a gothic draw for ghost hunters looking to unravel its mysteries. The start of the Sally House hauntings the house has reportedly been the scene of practically every kind of spooky phenomenon. You name it, attacks, shadow persons, objects moving on their own, disembodied sounds, and appearances. This may be the reason the house has received so much media attention over the past 20 years. Even well-known television programs like The Haunting, Unexplained Mysteries, Ghost Adventures, and Sightings have included the house. Some people think the Sally House hauntings may be demonic in origin because the activity has occasionally been so intense. Some people think that the Sally House serves as a type of portal via which spirits can go to our world. Regardless of what is contained within its walls, the house is unquestionably haunted, according to everyone.
People have claimed to have personally witnessed the apparitions of an older woman standing in the windows as well as the apparition of a little girl, who many believe to be Sally. Unembodied voices of men, women, and children have been heard by some, and things have been known to pick up and move through the air on their own. Candles have also been known to light and burn on their own. There are often sounds of moving furniture and scratching on the walls late at night. Even more physical assaults and thefts have reportedly occurred. Although the house is known as the Sally House, there is no concrete evidence that a girl by the name of Sally ever lived there. However, there are rumors that the house is owned by a guy by the name of Dr. Charles Finney, who reportedly runs his office out of the house's first floor. Finney's unsuccessful effort to conduct Sally's emergency surgery gave rise to the legend of Sally. There are two versions of the Sally story, one of which claims that a mother hurried to her sick six-year-old when the child began to complain of excruciating abdominal pain. The girl's appendix was on the verge of rupturing, so Dr. Finney decided to operate on her at his house without using any anesthetics. Later, she died on the operating table. Sally was conceived in the alternative version as a result of a relationship Dr. Finney was having. The young girl's mother brought her to Finney when she fell ill because he would not let her go to the hospital because of concern that his adulterous escapades would be discovered. Rather, he carried out her urgent surgery himself. There is no doubt that the house has seen its fair share of horrible incidents, despite the fact that the Sally narrative cannot be independently corroborated. In the early 2000s, a pentagram was discovered drawn on the basement floor of the house. Even remnants of satanic rituals have been discovered, and a luminol test conducted on the master bedroom closet revealed signs of blood spatter. A substance called luminol causes the blood's proteins to glow under a black light. The Sally House's current hauntings following the arrival of Tony and Debbie Pickman, nothing happened for a month. As they grew accustomed to their new surroundings, lights began to dim on their own, and animals began acting strangely. After the birth of their child, the activity picked up, and strange molds began to grow on household items. The pair even once came home from a day out to discover the nursery's plush toys arranged in a circle on the floor. Tony experienced severe burning that night, and it was later found that he had three large scrapes running down his spine. Sally's desire to be accepted by the Pickmans as a sort of phantom daughter is revealed after learning about the history of the house and her life narrative. Soon later, Tony continued to be attacked. At their child's birthday celebration, a doll even mysteriously caught fire. The Pickman family ultimately moved out after two years of being physically and mentally abused within the house. Sally, according to Debbie Pickman, was not a child's spirit but rather a wicked entity that assumed the identity of a child to win the family's faith. For what ulterior motive, we'll never know. Even though it's difficult to determine who actually owns the house these days, Les Smith Jr. has been the legal owner for more than 20 years, according to the Sally House's official website. Those who venture inside are welcome to take a tour or even spend the night there. The house of death, when a property is deemed, the house of death, you know there's bound to be at least one gut-wrenching story attached to it. In one of New York's most picturesque neighborhoods, the structure itself is just as charming as any of the other revivalist Greek brownstones. Many of the brilliant and beautiful residents of the city have lived at the house of death, which was built in 1856 on West 10th Street in Greenwich Village. Including the spouse of James Borman Johnston, who established the Metropolitan and Broadway Underground Railroads. A reading room, a library, and the renowned 10th Street Studio, at the time, the only collective with studios, galleries, and annual financing for resident artists in New York City, were all founded by Johnston. In the 1880s, his affluent widow one relocated their daughters into the house of death after he passed away. The house seems to have started earning its reputation gradually after the Borman family stopped living there. The first recorded incident of bad luck happened in 1897. Cycling celebrity Fred H. Andrew, the new owner and occupier of 14 West 10th Street had a moment of bad luck. During his residency, as described in the New York Times of August 9, 1897, Andrew had a moment of reckless bicycle riding that caused him to hit a boy, or around eight years old. The boy suffered a broken leg and Andrew was subsequently arrested. Mark Twain, though, was the house's most well-known resident. 
At the height of his fame but nearing the end of his writing career, a mustachioed legend of American literature. Twain, whose true name is Samuel Clemens, lived at the House of Death for only three years when cyclist Fred H. Andrew began a string of unlucky events. Only slightly more than a year passed when Mark Twain resided in the home. While suffering bankruptcy, he continued to produce some of his hurried but outstanding works. He was also dealing with depression, which was made worse by the tragic mustache he always sported. Even though Twain was known for his disbelief in ghosts, he wrote of a very clear paranormal experience he had in his new house. One evening, he witnessed a large piece of wood kindling move in the air all by itself. Thinking the wood was being moved by a rat, that had some use for the wood, a new piece of furniture perhaps, he shot it with his gun, as anyone would do. It suddenly fell to the ground, surrounded by a few drops of blood. Rats outnumbered people in New York, even them, but the house was not noted for having an infestation. Twain maintained the blood was that of a rodent and not that of a ghost. Twain can still be seen wandering the house of death stairs, despite the fact that he did not have many fond recollections of the place. His image has been seen by subsequent occupants walking up and down the stairs, which are thought to be the most haunted area of the house. He might also be to blame for the inaudible marching noises that have been reported throughout the vacant areas of the house. In the late 1930s, there was one significant Twain contact documented. The West 10th Street house had been transformed by 1937 into a co-op building with 10 roomy condo apartments. Among the, the ghost of Mark Twain was sitting on a window seat when a newly moved in mother and her little daughter ran across him shortly after the building underwent renovation. His words, my name is Clemens, and I have a problem here I gotta settle, were spoken casually as he walked up to the two. A little while later, he vanished into thin air. He remained silent about the issue he was having, which was probably a financial one. One can't always go asleep peacefully due to its miserable money. Another puzzle is why Mark Twain, who passed away in Danbury, Connecticut, rather than at his New York home, keeps popping up here so frequently. In 1957, Jan Bryant Bartell and her daughter moved into a spacious flat on the top level. The flat where the servants had previously resided was now occupied by the well-known actress, medium, and author. Almost immediately, Bartell noted that, a monstrous moving shadow, frequently followed her around the house. She claims to have once witnessed a ghostly man standing in a hallway. She bravely reached out and attempted to touch whatever she could see. She felt something, but it was unlike anything she had ever felt before. Chilly and wet. Diaphanous like a swamp mist or an ether cloud. Her finger tips began to feel cold. They tingled despite being numb. The aroma appeared in the split second between contact and recoil. Vulnerable and slow. And sweet, excruciatingly, sickeningly sweet. The Bartell family reported detecting other strange and unpleasant fragrances when they were at the house of death in addition to this peculiar one. Food that they had not purchased would suddenly appear at the table, already decomposing as if it had been sitting there for days. Their numerous little creatures would also frequently show signs of aggression without provocation, as if startled by intangible foes inside the structure. Bartell, a fervent believer, took the proactive measure of hiring a paranormal expert to look into what might be generating the residents' horrific experiences. The investigator backed up what the pair had assumed all along. The investigator said that the house of death was home to more than 22 ghosts. Along with Mark Twain, he also mentioned a young girl, a white-dressed woman, and a gray cat. In a manuscript describing her psychic encounters with the supernatural while residing at 14 West 10th Street, Bartell made the decision to write about her experiences there. In her book, Spindrift, Spray from a Psychic Sea, she describes what it was like to live in a haunted house in great detail. The emotional prose is flowery and conjures a picture of a woman on the edge of our world and the border of another. The book was warmly welcomed and has garnered many positive reviews. Bartell reports having visions and hearing a lot of strange noises around the house. Here is an excerpt from Spindrift's jacket, death started to happen in the house, like in a game of ten little Indians. A dog, Penelope, who was dear to Jan, was the first to pass away. But she would find out about the first tenant's death within the next 24 hours. 
The deaths, whether from heart attacks, suicide, or murder, occurred one after another quickly. The Bartel family fled Greenwich Village in terror after their nine little Indians disappeared. But the spooking stuck with them. Jan Bartel became the tenth. Bartel passed away in what can be seen as suspicious circumstances not long after finishing the book. She experienced depressive spells, and there were rumors that she had attempted suicide. Her passing gave credibility to the myth surrounding the house of death and its curse. However, there were still a lot of doubters because murders in New York are frequently unsolved. However, one incident led some people to question the house's standing. On November 2, 1987, a true tragedy occurred at the house of death in New York City. The murder of Lisa Nussbaum had a convoluted storyline befitting of Hollywood horror films. At around 6.40 a.m., Hedda Nussbaum, a children's novelist and editor, called the 9-11 operators urgently. Lisa, her six-year-old daughter, wasn't breathing, according to the woman, so an ambulance was quickly dispatched to her Greenwich home. A really unsettling scene awaited the paramedics when they arrived. They discovered Lisa unconscious and naked on the kitchen floor, and Mitchell bound to a playpen and covered in his own feces. Nussbaum had multiple fractured bones and was covered in bruises. Additionally, at the flat, investigators found over 20 crack pipes, marijuana, cocaine, and hashish, as well as $25,000 in cash. Unfortunately, while en route to the hospital, paramedics were unable to perform CPR on Lisa Nussbaum. Repeated blunt force trauma to the head was identified as the cause of death by autopsy. Lisa's father, attorney Joel Steinberg, and Hedda Nussbaum were both detained and later charged with first-degree murder. Joel Steinberg was accused of abusing Lisa and his wife in a violent manner following a cocaine binge. A charge against Hedda Nussbaum was dropped in exchange for her evidence against Joel Steinberg. He received a jail sentence after being convicted guilty of second-degree manslaughter by a jury. Joel Steinberg left the legal system after being released in 2004 and started working in construction. The house of death became home to a real-life monster, just like the mansion in the Amityville horror movie. The events at the House of Death were also affecting the nearby residences on the street. Residents of the apartment block next door began to observe flickering lights, and several people saw a ghostly woman in a long robe strolling a hallway. She had supposedly been floating through doors for more than 20 years, as documented by a local photographer. The home itself is still beautiful, proportionate, and conceals the growing fear that has taken up residence inside. The classic brownstone in Greenwich Village, close to the lovely Washington Square, reverberates with ghastly, unsettling tales of the numerous people who have left a piece of their souls in the structure of the building. If there is any moral to be learned from these tales, it is that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. The building, which is now privately owned and is still occupied, keeps adding eerie tales to the folklore of supernatural activity at the house of death. The stairway is still the center of the building's paranormal activity, and many ghosts regularly make their rounds of the dark, spacious ancient stairs. The Lizzie Borden House A family house was constructed in Fall River, Massachusetts, in 1845. Before Andrew Borden bought it in the middle of the 1800s, it was a family house. Making it into a substantial single-family residence for his family. In 1860, Lizzie Borden was born in this home. Three years later, Sarah, her biological mother, had passed away. And three years later, her father wed Abby, a new bride. At the time, Abby was deemed unmarriable because of her age of 37. It was a huge surprise to marry someone of Andrew's rank in Fall River. She yearned for the prestige and respect that Abby had never had. Some claim that Andrew didn't care for her only wanted to find a new mother for his children Lizzie and Emma. And a housekeeper as well. In the home at 232nd Street, they all resided. Before a terrible afternoon in August 1892. Perhaps as a result of Lizzie and Emma's hatred for Abby. Calling her Mrs. Borden in a mocking manner. Avoiding her presence to the point of refusing to eat with the family. Andrew and Abby transformed the home into a cold and heartless environment as an act of emotional retaliation. Lizzie felt unappreciated as a result. She disobeyed. 
she allegedly stole from nearby businesses. Rumor that was first spread as fact. The Fall River Herald News reports that this might not be the case after all. Following her conviction in 1897, rumors may have given rise to the tale. People discussing Lizzie Borden, the murderous woman, and any indications of her psychopathy. According to their 2022 report, the incident was prominently featured on the front pages of numerous local news outlets. Hankering after spectacular Lizzie news. The report was swiftly dropped by the newspapers, maybe indicating that the whole event was a mistake. However, the negative publicity fed rumors from snitches that Lizzie had always been a well-known crook. She wasn't viewed as the ideal daughter, though. But despite her loathing for Abby, Lizzie continued to respect her father's authority over her. However, it is claimed that she had little love for the men. The sisters' misgivings about Abby's financial goals caused the anger to grow more intense. They knew she was vying after the Andrews' affluence and power. Their father succumbed to the charm and bought her a bevy of expensive gifts. Lizzie and Emma were envious of this. The entire Borden family was ill. Before that dreadful Thursday in August 1892, they had been confined to the house for days. It's almost 10.30 a.m., and Abby believed she was alone. Cleaning a guest room on the second floor. She heard a creak as she was making the bed. When she turned around, the murderer was holding something in the air. A little hatchet's corner was illuminated. Later publications classified this as a passion crime. Claiming that each swing used to beat Abby's head into a pulp contained anger. The killer kept swinging even after he was knocked flat to the ground. In the meantime, Andrew arrived at the house after his morning walk and climbed the front steps. When he tried to open the door, his key wouldn't turn. The family's maid came over from the kitchen and started yelling and knocking. From the inside, the lock did not turn either. It was backed up. To Andrew, she yelled through the door. There came a silence. There was a breather. The maid heard creaking coming from the upper floorboards as she looked up the stairs. It was difficult to see due to the shadows, but she sensed someone was watching her from above. Then there was a sound. I get shivers remembering so many parts of this day. Not this one more than any other. It sounded like a woman gently chuckling. Allegedly Lizzie, shortly after savagely killing her stepmother. Holding the hatchet at her side, she is standing there covered in her blood. The maid remained silent. Returning to the door, twisting the lock with a pop with renewed vigor. After thanking the maid, Andrew pushed open the door and entered the home. Planned to do out his daily tasks without knowing that his wife had died and that his deadly daughter was upstairs. I imagined myself as the maid. She was perplexed as to why she said nothing to Andrew or the woman at the top of the stairs. Nothing. Like yelling, stop attempting to frighten me. Even yet, perhaps the maid was accustomed to the peculiar habits of wealthy families. As an alternative, she kept cleaning. Cleaning the third floor as I ascend the rear steps. She waits before Lizzie's yells can be heard coming from the first floor. Father's dead. Someone killed him when they broke in. When the police arrived, they discovered Andrew on the couch with his legs crossed. In the final report, the killer struck his face and head 11 times with a hatchet-like weapon. One closed eyelid was split in two, which let them know he was asleep. There was just one suspect, Lizzie Borden. The trial took a while. In the courtroom, each detail was painstakingly studied and discussed. The maid gave evidence claiming not to have seen either murder. She mentioned the laughter coming from the top of the stairs and confirmed that Lizzie was inside the house. Timing indicates that the incident took place following Abby's murder. Although it was spooky to everyone, Lizzie was not incriminated. After that, the jury heard the police report read. Based on Lizzie's statement, which she gave while her parents were laying dead nearby. She provided cops with information, when my father was killed, I was in the barn. He must have been murdered by a stranger who entered from the street and fled. Lizzie was sporting a different clothing, which is interesting. From the maid's evidence, I believe. Before the cops arrived, she put on a different clothing. She had to bring them the second dress, they insisted. Lizzie then added, I destroyed it. Why did you burn it, they questioned. Because I spilled paint on it, was her response. Police also discovered a hatchet head in the basement while examining the home. All bright and tidy, however the handle is gone.
the defense said that Lizzie took the handle off. Since blood that has soaked into wood cannot be cleansed. Strangely, the jury thought the argument was absurd. Giving a hint as to what the verdict's outcome would be. In a last-ditch effort, the prosecution made an effort to highlight Lizzie's narcissistic lack of empathy. Stating that she didn't give a damn about her deceased parents or anyone else. They carried out two unusual wood cases in dramatic fashion, the jury watching and Lizzie wondering what was going on. The prosecutor grabbed the lock and swung open the crates, showing Andrew and Abby Borden's fractured heads. They anticipated Lizzie's response to such a startling and ominous sight would be cold and emotionless. Demonstrating to the jury her murderous intent. Wrong. This might have been the turning point for Lizzie's innocence. She yelled, stood up, swooned, and then collapsed to the ground. It wasn't long until the jury returned with their decision. Lizzie Borden was free after being found not guilty. The court declared them innocent. But everyone else believes you are guilty. She became notorious, as evidenced by the well-known rhyme. Using an axe, Lizzie Borden, and struck her mother 40 times. She gave her father 41 when she realized what she had done. The rhyme is thought to have been written by a Fall River-based journalist. It has a hook. Really excellent flow. But not in a historical sense. You are aware of my penchant for grisly details. Lizzie allegedly struck Abby 19 times and Andrew 11 times. After the trial, you may anticipate that I would delve further into Lizzie Borden's life. I am, however, nothing if not mysterious. Instead, the information will reflect the kind of life she lead. Freakin' dull. Yes, Fall River people were disappointed that Lizzie was let go. Even worse, she and Emma received Andrew's house as inheritance. They spent many years cohabitating. Emma abruptly left after that in 1905. No one is aware of Emma's departure. Many rumors exist. However, a 2013 post on the Lizzie Borden Society forum nicely condenses it. Nancy Drew reports. One of three explanations. She first discovered Lizzie smoking and drinking after she joined a nearby theater company. She also learned that Lizzie had been having an affair with Nance O'Neill, a member of the theater company. Or three, she learned that Lizzie had truly murdered Abby and Andrew, sure, Everyone likes to think that it is the result of murder. Maybe. Considering that Lizzie and Emma never spoke again. She relocated to New Hampshire and led a solitary existence there up until her passing. Sisters forever and from afar. What an amazing coincidence this is. Take this. On June 1, 1927, Lizzie passed away from acute pneumonia. And Emma passed away, on June 10, 1927, from the phritis, a kidney condition, just nine days later. They are both interred in Fall River's Oak Grove Cemetery beside their families. Lizzie is dozing off close to Andrew and Abby. An elderly woman is frequently spotted wandering the house. Some visitors believe it to be the housekeeper or the BNB owner. When they stand up to say hello to the woman, they are by themselves. It's Abby. Performing her chores, then entering the guest room to meet her stepdaughter and grab a hatchet. Abby is typically spotted in the guest room and corridor on the second level. Visitors who have slept in the chamber have reported feeling the bedclothes close around them. Then you'll hear what sounds like hands swiping across the blankets. Just a little touch on their legs and chest. Abby carefully adjusting the fabric stance. Making the bed quietly on what was assumed to be a typical Thursday morning. What about Lizzie, though? She's also present. Visitors in the room next to her often snore at night. Though subtle, it cannot be denied. On the other side of the wall, there was the sound of a woman sobbing. Repeatedly reported to the hosts. Same sobbing at the same hour of the night. And try to see yourself as the host. Every day and night. Thank you again for joining us for another video. If you liked the video, Please like, subscribe and comment down below and let us know what you would like to hear in the near future. See you all again soon.